So last time I gave a radiology lecture, I presented slides that didn't have labels. And I did that because I wanted to encourage you to listen to my words and because, very importantly, the only course you were taking was gross anatomy. And that meant that you would have the time to go home and go through the radiology on the website and learn the material. Sadly, you are now taking other courses and your time constraints are much more severe. And I therefore have changed and have decided to label all of the slides I'm going to show, which means that you no longer have to listen to my words. But I think it would be wise for you, truly uh, educational, to do so. All right, start off as I do regularly with plane films. These are abdominal plane films of two separate individuals. And as you can judge, you can't see hardly anything. You can't see hardly anything on abdominal plane films because uh, things are either water density and they all merge together, or there's a couple air bubbles in things because you always have air in your bowel. And depending upon how much air you have in it and, and what loops of bowel or the air is in is, is determines what you can see. Now, I can see some things here. I picked these because they actually show as much as almost any abdominal plane films show. First of all, in terms of soft tissue structures on the one on the left, you can see the edge right here, this oblique edge on this side. You can see even more clearly on this side uh, of the psoas major muscle. The reason we can see the edge is because there's a little retroperitoneal fat on the side of it, so it doesn't blend completely. It has a, it has a silhouette. It silhouettes itself against the little retroperitoneal fat. You can see air in various bits and pieces of bowel. Uh, here's some air in the ascending colon. I say that's the ascending colon because it's on the side that the ascending colon is on. I say this is the descending colon because it's on the side. And I say this is transverse colon because it's running across between them. Uh, here's a little air thing. And if, this, if I was right that this is transverse colon, then this must be air in the stomach. Because you know the transverse colon is suspended inferior to the stomach by the gastrocolic ligament. And here, just again on position, I would call that sigmoid colon. On this one, which has less air in the bowel, I mean, and there's this air right here. I mean, maybe I don't even know what those things are. Uh, you can see, again, because the kidney is surrounded in people by fat called perirenal fat, you can often see the margins of a kidney right here. That's the margins of the right kidney, more subtly, the margin of the left kidney. And here's something which might be the inferior most point on the liver. Bottom line is you don't see much. And therefore, these things are really only done, plain films of the abdomen, to spot something like this. Anybody know what's wrong or have any idea what's wrong? Yes? Air in the bowel? Air in the bowel. Very good. This is an obstructed bowel with air accumulation, accumulating proximal to the obstruction. You can see this big thing here. That's the stomach. Here is the pylorus, where it's narrower. There's the first part of the duodenum there. This is all small intestine. Colon runs up on the right, across, and down on the left. Colon does not go back and forth. And if you have this back and forth pattern to your air, it would be small intestine. This is the reason you do plain cones of the abdomen. If you, someone has a distended abdomen, you want to see if there's intestinal obstruction. If you want to do uh, plain films of the abdomen, for other reasons, you have to really have the person take and bury them. You have to have them swallow barium so you can see what's going on. Uh, it's still done from time to time, especially it's done if you have an issue of transport, how fast things are moving through the bowel. You may have them swallow barium and just track it as it gets transported down and give you a sense of the time of things. Otherwise, as you'll see, You'll see everything's done with CT. So this is a person early in a barium swallow. And it's filled their stomach. And we can see up here, which at the top is where the fundus of the stomach is, there is no barium. Whereas the body and the antrum are filled with barium completely. So what does this tell you about the position of this person when the x-ray was taken? If there is no barium in 
the fundus, but there is barium in the rest of the stomach. Yes, sir. They're either standing or sitting? Uh, they are neither standing nor sitting, although that's a pretty good answer. Uh, this person, I will tell you, is lying down because he's actually he's always taken lying down. But that's a, that's a reasonable answer. I was going to say. Standing. Well, I'll tell you now, this person's lying down. So now you've just done where they're lying down, their stomach or their back? Stomach. Why do you say so? Stomach is the answer given. Why do you say so? Because the fundus is on the anterior side of the body. It's funny that you should say stomach, which is the correct answer, but give an answer saying the fundus is anteriorly positioned. If they were lying, if the fundus was anterior and they were lying on their stomach, that's where the barium would settle, into the most anterior region. And in fact, they are lying on their stomach, and it has settled into the most anterior region. And the most anterior region of the stomach is really the pyloric antrum, the most posterior region of the stomach is the fundus. And because they are lying on their stomach, all the barium has drained out of the most posterior region of the stomach into the most anterior region, and that's why the fundus doesn't have any barium in it. Uh, beyond the pylorus, as I said, we have the first part of the duodenum, which clinicians call either the duodenal bulb or duodenal cap in this kind of x-ray. And then you can see the feathery descending horizontal and ascending part of the duodenum, and then that turns into the jejunum, and the barium hasn't traveled any further when they took this x-ray. Here's a person where the, the barium has traveled further. Again, I presume the person's lying, lying on their uh, belly, on their abdomen, because the antrum is filled with barium. Uh, and this just shows you the feathery jejunum, which is the upper left hand, upper left hand portion of your abdomen, and the less feathery ilium uh, down here in the lower right-hand part, and then it's already entered some into the ascending colon as well. If you want to study the colon, you're better off to actually put barium into, through the rectum, or what's called a barium enema. And uh, that's what's happened in this person. They had a barium enema, and you can see the sigmoid, and uh, uh, well, you see the things that are labeled. However, more than anything, when you want to study the bowel, you will do a CT scan of the abdomen. You usually do it with a barium swallow as well. They'll drink, you have to drink a lot of barium. And uh, they'll do, and I'll show you a CT of someone that's done that. And CTs of the abdomen, extremely common. I put these up here just to remind you of some of the relationships that we're going to be talking about. Again, CTs, MRIs, MRAs, they are nothing other than a knowledge of your relationships, a knowledge of relationships applied to what's black, white, or gray. So all, all I'm going to do is recite for you the relationships that help you to make up your mind as to what you're looking for. <coughs> Some of the relationships will be wanting to uh, pay attention to the fact that the inferior vena cava, and I haven't drawn the rest of the, a the aorta, are the only things that are, um, th are this are coming from the chest through the diaphragm to get into the abdomen. Uh, the liver is way at the top, and then as you travel down, uh, you expect to see the fundus of the stomach and, and the spleen. You'll see the gallbladder tucked in, hanging on the undersurface of the liver. Uh, you will see the right suprarenal gland posterior to the inferior vena cava. That's a fixed, always invariant relationship. In fact, it's one of the only ways. Now, sometimes the only way you can tell where the inferior vena cava is, but it's a good way of telling where the right suprarenal gland is. Um, as you get down, you'll come then across the first uh, branch, the first anteriorly directed branch of the aorta, which is the celiac artery, which arises at the upper border of the body of the pancreas. Then you will come to the body, come to all of the pancreas, actually, usually the tail first and then the body, and finally the head a little bit lower down, because the head's a little bit lower down than the body and neck of the pancreas, a little inferior. Uh, running along the upper border of the pancreas, we'll see the splenic artery. Running posterior to the pancreas, we'll see the splenic vein. We'll see the splenic vein meet the superior mesenteric vein behind the neck of the pancreas. That's where the portal vein forms and runs up to the liver. We'll see the origin just below the celiac artery of the superior mesenteric artery, really within a centimeter or so of it. And that will arise behind the body of the pancreas. And it will, it will be 
and the termination of the splenic vein will pass over the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. And we'll see the superior mesenteric vein and mesenteric, superior mesenteric arteries. They travel down with the vein lying to the right of the <coughs> artery. And then as we get down around L3, we'll see the inferior mesenteric artery and to its left, the inferior mesenteric vein. So the veins bracket the arteries. The superior mesenteric vein is to the right of the superior mesenteric artery. The inferior mesenteric vein is to the left of the inferior mesenteric artery. And we'll see lots of other things, which, which I'm not going to study on this talk. talk about. So I'm going to go through a series of these CTs. I thought there were, I think I made a mistake, but that's done. As it, I thought there were too many things to label in each one to just fill up that whole thing with labels. So I so I'd go through and look at a few things and start over again, look at a few more, start over again, look at a few more. We'll see how that works out, but I'm not sure that's right. Uh, this you know, don't you? Because this is the heart. Here is the, I remind you, the right atrium, which forms the right border of the heart. Here's right at the inferior most part of the right atrium where the IVC enters it. Here is our right ventricle, interventricular septum, left ventricle, which forms most of the left border of the heart. Here's the esophagus with air in it and descending aorta. Here's the azagous vein, hemiazagous vein. I don't see the thoracic duct all that well. Maybe that little dot there is. Anyway, we're going to follow the inferior vena cava down and the descending aorta down as they pierce the diaphragm and enter the abdomen. And that's what they're doing here. Now we start to see the liver. Liver is generally the first of the organs you see. It is the highest organ uh, in a person who's lying down. And then it looks like the inferior vena cava disappears. But the inferior vena cava doesn't disappear. It just looks that way. Why does it look that way? Sir? It travels on the posterior side in the liver. That's true, and why does it look that way? I guess the water density would be the same. Yes, excellent. These are two water density structures. They merge together in the CT scan, and the only way you could tell them apart is if you had contrast in your inferior vena cava. Now, this person has <laughs> intravascular contrast, and you can see it's in the aorta. That aorta looks much whiter than its typical water density structure would but the contrast has not reached the inferior vena cava to any significant degree here. So we cannot really see the boundary between the inferior vena cava and the because they're two water density structures. As we continue down, we start to clip the uppermost part of the spleen. And this person has swallowed barium. So right up against the spleen is the fundus of the stomach, again, posteriorly situated. The most posterior part of the stomach is the fundus. And if we continue down, the spleen gets bigger and bigger as we see more and more of it. Inferior vena cava is drawn to an area that I'm just guessing where it is, really. But now we see we're getting into the body of the stomach. And as, as the stomach is moving anteriorly, Now the inferior, here is the inferior vena cava still in the cable fossa of the liver. Now it's starting to emerge. The inferior vena cava is starting to emerge as we pass inferiorly from the cable fossa of the liver and now stands out as a more clearly separate structure. You say to yourself, that does not look like an inferior vena cava. <laughs> the inferior vena cava are supposed to be nice, round, big things. Well, you know, these are veins. The size of a vein depends entirely on the pressure around it. If this person you know, it's making a, a slight straining movement or for something, it collapses the vein. So you cannot count on a vein being a nice round structure. It, it might be collapsed. And this person's inferior vena cava is collapsed at this point. Actually, I can't say it's because of any breathing that the person's doing. I don't know why it's collapsed at that point. It just is. All right. Here's our stomach. Got some air in it here. And now we're really getting into the part where the body is turning into the antrum and the antrum is passing to the right. And then there are these two little metal clips in here, which I don't know what they are or why they're there, and the radiologist didn't mention them. Uh, but now the inferior vena cava is still collapsed. We'll just follow it down. It's receiving some tributaries we'll be talking about. 
Now it's starting to look more like what we ex expect the inferior vena cava to look like. A nice round, sort of round vessel. I don't know why it was collapsed higher than that. And we expect the aorta and the inferior vena cava to travel down side by side all the way to L4, as they will. And at L4, we expect the aorta to bifurcate into its common iliac branches, as it's doing. And usually at L5, though it looks like it might be a little higher in this person, we expect the inferior vena cava to be formed by the uh, common iliac veins. We'll spend more time on that when we do the pelvis. All right, let's take a look at this is a section we've seen, liver, inferior vena cava hidden from view, and the other things there. What's, what am I going to be looking at next? All right, here was our spleen. Here was the fundus of the stomach. Now we're seeing two air-filled things. Now, I've labeled what these two air-filled things are. But if, I, if you'd asked me if that was the only picture I was given, I'm not sure I would know what those two air-filled things are. But I know what they are because I followed them down the abdomen. They separate, ah, they separate very clearly at this point, and one of them takes up a position on the left side of the body near the spleen, and the other one, if we follow it, is going to run across from the left side to the right side, anteriorly in the abdomen, join <coughs> something on the right just below the liver and disappear. So these things were obviously, and they were labeled. That's how you. This is right up here at the splenic flexure of the colon. Now, in this person, the splenic flexure is not at the spleen, it's higher than the spleen. And I didn't realize until I started to prepare these that that is, in fact, the case in many individuals, that the splenic flexure is on the underside of the diaphragm higher than the spleen. But you just follow this. And now, here, as this is our liver, right here. If we go lower and lower and lower, we start to see something appear right here on the undersurface of the liver. That's the gallbladder. Why does the gallbladder look different than the liver? The gallbladder actually has a high fat, the bile has a high fat content, relatively high. 5% of bile is a fatty substance. And that, in fact, changes it from a pure water density structure to something which has a little bit different radiologic density. But we see the gallbladder right there. As it's on the undersurface of the liver. And then this is where its surface projection is on the anterior abdominal wall. Two, here is our spleen. Here is our stomach again. We're going down. A solid water density structure seeming to emanate from the vicinity of the spleen has a part which is posterior then wraps up anteriorly. Here's the part which is most anterior. And then as we go even further inferiorly, it has a big bulbous part here. That is the pancreas. That is probably the keystone to understanding so much of abdominal CT is to identify the pancreas and know where you are. So, this points out, I'm going back up again. This should be the tail region right about here, as it runs in the lino renal ligament to the spleen. That means the rest of this is the body. <coughs> this is a part of the body. The most anterior part of the pancreas is the body near the neck, because the, the rest of the body and the tail are very posteriorly positioned. The most anterior part is the body near the neck. And then a little bit more posterior is the head of the pancreas. What is one? If this was our stomach, or our clips, this is the first part of the duodenum coming from the stomach. Then this part, the first part is heading posteriorly to turn into the second part of the duodenum. Right here, I, uh, one is just duodenum. The head of the pancreas, as you know, is within the duodenal sweep. So the structure, which is immediately to the right of the head of the pancreas, is always the second part of the duodenum. We don't know what this is yet, but we'll trace it and figure out why it's duodenum. If this is second part of the duodenum, immediately to the right of the head of the pancreas, and this second part of the duodenum, as I go further down, second part, second part, second part, second part, second part, 
boom, it zips across as the third part. Can we change the unctinate part of the pancreas? All right, I will tell you now, but it was covered in the later slide. So let me just finish. This was then the third part of the duodenum. If I go back up again and I follow our third part of the duodenum, that becomes then the ascending part here. So the third part of the duodenum is the part which travels across from right to left, anterior to the interior vena cava and anterior to the aorta. And if you go back up from this third part, obviously you've got the second part on the right side, the fourth part on the left side. The uncinate process. You know, I am going to make you wait. I'll cover it. I'm just going to make you wait. It's light from the big city. All right. So we've got all our pancreas and duodenum covered. We've got ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon covered, and stomach. We've covered a lot of things. Now we get to things which are actually rather difficult. Here's a little funny sort of upside down V-shaped thing. Here's another on this side, an upside down V or Y-shaped thing. This one is an absolute dead giveaway. When you see this sort of upside down Y-shaped thing, posterior to the, what is the inferior vena cava, right here, that is your right adrenal gland. The right adrenal gland is posterior to the inferior vena cava. The left adrenal gland does not have such a fixed, easily identified relationship, so I just identify it as this sort of thing. Here's the kidney. Kidneys are starting to appear here. The kidneys have contrast area contrast in them because this person's had intravascular contrast, which gets concentrated in the kidneys and excreted. So this thing I'm calling left suprarenal gland only because it's roughly where it ought to be. But uh, I really, you know, it just looks like a big glob and would really be hard pressed to, uh, to identify it with any great certainty. This one on the right suprarenal gland, you can identify with certainty because of its fact that it's posterior to the inferior vena cava. So one R and one L are the kidneys, two R and two L are the suprarenal glands. You don't know, you haven't seen them yet. You'll see them in dissection today, all right? And you haven't seen yet in dissection three R and three L, which are called the crura of the diaphragm. The diaphragm, are, did you give a lecture on the diaphragm? Not yet. Not yet. The diaphragm, you'll see it when you do your dissection, has a very complicated origin from the posterior abdominal wall. And part of it are these muscular extensions along the side of the vertebral column. And they are referred to as the crura of the diaphragm. And they bracket the aorta as the aorta is traveling down. So you'll see those in the section. 3R would be called the left crus of the diaphragm. 3R would be called the right crus of the diaphragm. That's, they look like muscle here. And then the kidneys have lots of vessels going in and out of them, which we'll talk about later. Back again. Now, a familiar one, here was our liver, here was our aorta, the inferior vena cava, barely visible, maybe has a tiny little bit of contrast in it. Uh, it enables us to sort of pick it out here in the cable fossa. Here was our spleen, and now we see a vessel, part of a vessel, and another part of that same vessel. But we haven't reached the pancreas yet. If we go down a level, still I don't see pancreas. Now I do. Here's pancreas coming <coughs> in. Here. So this is a vessel that I see superior to the pancreas, running towards the spleen, and that is the splenic artery. The splenic artery runs along the superior border of the pancreas, and it tends to be a very curly Q artery. I'm sure you've seen that in your cadavers. So when you see it in a CT, you don't see a nice long thing. You see you're catching. It's, it's going up and down and wavy, and you're catching bits and pieces of it. So here's the splenic artery. Go down one level. There's a bit of the splenic artery, a bit of the splenic artery. Go down one level. And now, sorry, again, splenic, I think that's splenic artery anyway, still. But here I start to see pancreas. So now when I start to see a nice good chunk of pancreas, I'm already inferior to the splenic artery because the splenic artery runs along its upper border. So this vessel that I see right here, uh, it's not labeled here, but I, I should have labeled here, 
That's a vessel that does not run along the upper border of the pancreas. That's a vessel which runs posterior to the pancreas. And that's a nice straight vessel, too. It doesn't have waviness to it. So that, in fact, is the splenic vein, which will be lab labeled on another slide. So we, and this is all we're seeing here, the splenic artery, at this point, just near its beginning. In fact, no, this is a bit too, because it's curling around here. But we've come to this vessel right here. This is the first branch off the anterior surface of the aorta that we've seen. I'm going to go back up again, follow this aorta down, 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 and now we see its first anteriorly directed branch. That's the celiac. You know that. You know that the celiac has three branches, typically. It has a splenic, which heads off to the left, a left gastric, which heads superiorly, and a gastroduodenal, which heads to the right. And we can see them all here in this section. Common hepatic. What did I call it? Gastroduodenal? Thank you. Common hepatic. Yes, that is right, and I'm wrong. This, here's our splenic artery, and now you actually can sort of see it coming off the celiac right there. We go up a section. Here is the common hepatic going off to the right from the celiac, and if I go up another section, I guess, here's the left gastric. How do I know that's left gastric artery? I mean, it's, it's only called left gastric because it looks to me like it's coming off the celiac and heading more or less right there. You can see it heading more or less right there towards the stomach. And I know the, the three branches of the celiac. So I know I'm looking for one I can call splenic, one I can call common hepatic, one I can call left gastric. And I can only identify them by the, the directions they're going. Splenic's going to the left, common hepatic's going to the right, <coughs> and left gastric is heading towards the stomach. Yeah, but, doesn't, but doesn't the left gastric? Ascend? It does ascend. So this would be lower than that. Well, we're at right at the beginning as it's given off and then heading up. But I have no other choice. I agree with Dr. Larson. So doesn't the left gastric ascend? And the answer is yes, it does. And that's why I think we've just caught it in, in section. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling it left. I, yeah. I call it. I, here's, no, but actually you raise a very valid point. There's a reason for giving names to things here. I made a determination that that was a branch of the celiac. I made a determination that it wasn't the splenic and it wasn't the common hepatic. And that left me only with left gastric. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. But it's, it's, I, it's how you make your determination, which are your tests of anatomic knowledge, not whether you're absolutely right or wrong in any particular case. Now, when you're a doctor, it makes a difference if you're wrong. Right. But not, if you, not when you're a doctor. So that was a good point. So, our, so those are the various branches of the celiac. And now let's take a look at some, again, these are sections we've seen. Spleen, we know that this, this is our splenic artery here. This is our body of the stomach, our ant, towards the anterior of the stomach. Here was our termination of the transverse colon on the left side, the beginning of the descending colon on the left side. We might, here was our inferior vena cava here. Here are crur of the diaphragm. Here was the splenic vein I told you about. Here's a giant vein seemingly emerging from the liver. Now, in fact, it's really a giant vein going into the liver. But we're looking at it as because we see it in its distal part before we see it in its origin. So this giant vein which seems to emerge from the liver is the portal vein. That's the only giant vein that has anything to do with the liver other than the inferior vena cava when you know that's not that. And we expect that this portal vein and that splenic vein will meet up because the splenic vein is one of the structures that forms the portal vein by joining the superior mesenteric vein. Splenic vein runs posterior to the pancreas. We want it to meet up with this thing we call the portal vein. If they don't meet up, we are wrong. Right? Portal vein, splenic, portal, splenic. By golly, they do meet up. That's very good. They meet up behind a portion of the pancreas, which is the neck of the pancreas. And by, virtually by definition, the neck of the pancreas is defined as that part anterior to the formation of the portal vein. So this is where the splenic is coming in to form the portal vein. That means, if, here it is again, if we follow this thing right down, it, be, it is the superior mesenteric vein. Because if we come up again, it's, we are watching the superior mesenteric coming up from below, 
joining the splenic coming over from the left to form the portal. And now if I continue to go up, we'll trace this portal all the way to the liver. And so we've got portal vein formed behind the neck of the pancreas by a junction of splenic vein and superior mesenteric vein. I said that the, splenic, the termination of the splenic vein is anterior to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. So that's what this is, the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. Let me go up, up the section again. Here was our celiac. Remember our friend the celiac with a common hepatic and splenic and questionable left gastric. If I continue going down, celiac, nothing, a centimeter or so, and then superior mesenteric. And the superior mesenteric arises behind the termination of the splenic vein just before it goes into form the portal. And now I'm continuing down. I have superior mesenteric vein anterior to superior mesenteric artery, but they will switch. The vein, not switch, but the vein will move off to the left, right side, sorry, the right side. And now this is the question you asked. <laughs> This little bit of the head of the pancreas. Now here, let me go back and take a look at our pancreas again. Here's, here was you know, the body of the pancreas, the neck of the pancreas, the head of the pancreas, the second part of the duodenum here. This little bit of the head of the pancreas, which is tucked in posterior to the superior mesenteric vein, is called the uncinate process of the pancreas. If it's really big, it can tuck in under the superior mesenteric artery too. But in everybody I've ever seen, it tucks in under the superior mesenteric vein, and only some fraction of those is also tucking under the artery. So that's the uncinate process of the pancreas, part of the head. And then the, by this time, here's our superior mesenteric vein, which is anterior to the artery. By this time, it's taken up the position it was intended to have, which is to the right side of the artery. And those two will travel down. And they will cross the third part of the duodenum. You know that the superior mesenteric artery and superior mesenteric vein pass anterior to the third part of the duodenum, which is the thing we identified previously. Now what comes up next? Ah, let's take a look at our inferior vena cava. We're up high again. Here is our splenic something, probably splenic vein, celiac artery, common hepatic artery, splenic artery, here was our inferior vena cava, the collapsed inferior vena cava. All right. Here is a aorta. If we follow, if we head down, look at this collapsed inferior vena cava. It's being joined by two big vessels. The two big vessels which join the inferior vena cava from the side are the renal veins. And interestingly, because this is what God intended, the left renal vein passes just inferior to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. So here is our superior mesenteric artery right there, remember? And we go one level lower and we see the left renal vein crossing the aorta just inferior to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. I call this renal artery, I call it renal artery for two reasons. Number one, it's posterior to what I call the right renal vein. The arteries are posterior to the veins generally. And number two, I think I can see coming out of the aorta. So that would be the right renal artery. Left renal artery, here's something coming out of the aorta that's probably the left renal artery. Here it is there. It doesn't look so much, I must tell you, it doesn't look so much posterior to the vein on this side as inferior to it. But that's the way things go. Down, we're now down. Maybe you recognize this as a section L2, L3. Here was our inferior vena cava, inferior to the reason where it was collapsed. Here is our descending aorta. Here's the third part of the duodenum, very classical picture, third part of the duodenum. And here's the artery that arises from the front of the aorta behind or at the level of the lower border of the third part of the duodenum, and that's the inferior mesenteric artery. And I called this the inferior mesenteric vein because it was because I just did. I didn't I didn't provide enough information here to be 100 percent sure. To be honest with you, here's the inferior mesenteric artery coming off the aorta, traveling down, giving off a branch, maybe the left colic there, continuing down, 
continuing down, crossing the left common iliac artery to enter the pelvis. Going back up again, just some things that I just ignored, but which you can clearly see on the CT scan. You can see a nice linear elbow rectus abdominis. You see all three layers of the abdominal musculature. You see the serious major, and you see the quadratus lumborum. These are serious major and quadratus lumborum you'll see today in the lab if you haven't already. Following the aorta down and the inferior vena cava down, the aorta splits into the right and left common iliac arteries, and the inferior vena cava is formed by junction of the left common iliac vein and the right common iliac vein. Right there. Right. So, and then the rest of this is pelvic stuff. All right, here we go. Oh, no, this is nothing. I not nothing. You wait a little while, and all that contrast that you injected into the person is removed by the kidneys and is, enters the, uh, you don't know anything about kidneys. So it enters the excretory system of the kidneys. So remember, the, in, the other, in the other sections here, higher up in these, these are the earlier sections. Look at how the kidneys is very white because all of the intravascular contrast is in the tubular section of the kidneys being removed by them. When you go later in time, that's what the next series is, later in time, the kidney cortex and medulla is not so white. The contrast is actually in the collecting system. This is a major calyx, a major calyx, pelvis of the kidney, pelvis of the kidney, and that just uh, will turn into the two ureters. It will be nice and bright and shiny white with all the contrast as they travel down the anterior surface of the psoas major. You'll see that today in the lab. Not to go into that anymore. Anterior view. We expect, to, I'm going to go through this quickly, and they're not all labeled. Obviously, the really anterior structures in the abdomen are liver, transverse colon, and the antrum of the stomach. So we see the liver. We start to see the antrum of the stomach and the transverse colon. And we're heading posteriorly now in this reformatted section. So we're going to start anterior and head posteriorly. So that was the antrum of the stomach, the transverse colon. We do see the gallbladder starting to peek out, hanging on the under, or being suspended, if you will, from the undersurface of the liver. That's the gallbladder. We still see a nice transverse colon and stomach here, a bunch of small intestine with dye in it. Nothing new and interesting. Still but transverse colon. Yeah. The fact that there's air in the antrum of the stomach, does that mean he's probably lying in well, the fact that there's air in the antrum of the stomach, does it mean he's lying on his back? And the answer is yes. And that's a, a good observation. And of course, CTs are 100% of the time done with you lying on your back, so that's another clue. But uh, that is a good observation. All right, going back, further back, we're heading back. Anything interesting emerging? Heading back. Pancreas. Here, here, this is all our stomach now. Here's the whole stomach, essentially, right there. We go posteriorly from the stomach, posteriorly. The next interesting thing that emerges is the pancreas. This is the part of the body of the pancreas that sits over the vertebral column and is the most anterior part of the pancreas. That's the part we're going to see first. Only as we continue to go more posteriorly will we see the head and then the rest of the body and the tail. So if we follow this pancreas posteriorly, now we start to see the head. Now we start to see the part of the body here, and just, uh, just follow this. This is all pancreas, where the red dot is. We're heading posterior. Now we're getting to the region of the tail of the pancreas, way out here to the left. And then the spleen comes in. If we look at this pancreas here, where we have the body of it, we know that's the splenic artery, because the splenic artery is on the superior surface of the body. And we know that's the splenic vein, because the splenic vein is posterior. Let me go forward again. Some other just cute things you can see. Go, here's again, this is, we saw the pancreas right here, the body of the pancreas. This must be the neck of the pancreas, about right there. Are we right? Body, neck, head. We're right because that's the formation of, right there is the formation of the portal vein, of the SMV lying to the right of the SMA, joining the splenic vein, which, which is this thing here. 
to form the portal. Right. Head of pancreas is second part of duodenum, third part of duodenum, fourth or ascending part of duodenum. This is just like in the section. Here is an artery that's coming off. Here's the aorta and the common iliacs. If I go forward one step, here's an artery that's coming off the front of the aorta, posterior to the third part of the duodenum. That's the IMA. And here, following the IMA down, there's a sigmoidal branch, and then it's crossing the left common iliac artery to get into the pelvis. The IVC, here is our celiac artery coming off the aorta, superior mesentery coming off the aorta, the left renal vein passing in, crossing the surface of the aorta, anterior surface of the aorta, inferior to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. IVC, aorta, here the right renal, left renal, and as we continue to get into, ah, look at that. The upside down Y, this must be the, this must be the left supernatural gland, because these upside down Ys are what supernatural glands look like. But if I come forward again, if I focus on this and come forward, this right suprarenal gland, it's behind the inferior vena cava, right there. Right behind the inferior vena cava. And you look at some of these more on your own. I'm not going to spend much time on the left to right uh, gallbladder. The starting on the right side, heading left. Start. So we see the liver with the gallbladder suspended beneath it. As we go further and further, this must be the right kidney, which it is. We go further and further to the left. We expect to run into the second part of the duodenum. That's right here. And if we focus on that, we expect to run from the second part of the duodenum into the head of the pancreas, which we do. And if we focus on the pancreas, we expect to see the formation of the portal vein behind its neck from the SMV. And if we continue to the left, the splenic vein, here's the origin of the celiac artery and superior mesenteric, the superior mesenteric being behind typically the body of the pancreas. And here's our splenic vein with the splenic artery on the upper border of the pancreas. Fundus of stomach right at the back, beginning of the spleen on the left side. But these you can go through on your own. And I just threw that in there for the whole lot. Now we have something unusual. This is a different person entirely. I remind you of what we've got here. We've got liver. We've got aorta on the left anterior surface of the vertebral column. Here we have a nice round IVC. Beautiful, nice round IVC. Left kidney, right kidney, left, right crust of the diaphragm, left crust of the diaphragm, tail and body and neck of pancreas. Here's the splenic vein joining the superior mesenteric vein to form the portal vein. <coughs> Here it must be the SMA. Now, why did I why did I call that the SMA? Just from that all only that that all by itself. Why did I call that the SMA? It's an absolute classic relationship. Because it's emerging not at the head of the pancreas, it's emerging behind this thing right here, which is the termination of the splenic vein. The SMA arises behind the termination of the splenic vein. As soon as I decided that was splenic vein. That means I had to call that the SMA, behind the body of the pancreas in the eye. Now, that's, none of that's related to what the problem is here. I want you to focus on this inferior vena cava. Here it's getting a big vein from the right kidney. Right. Here, by the way, is the SMA and the SMV, but that's not. Here's the vein from the left kidney. Here's the unsummate process for the person who wanted to know, because here's the SMV and it's the portion of the pancreas posterior to the SMV. Here's the SMA. Focus on your renal vein. Remember what I told you about the left renal vein? I said absolutely it's diagnostic because it crosses the anterior surface of the aorta, inferior to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. 
What is this left renal vein doing? <coughs> hmm? It is posterior to the aorta. This is a not uncommon variant. It's called a retroaortic left renal vein. You can even get a what's called a circumaortic left renal vein. So these veins are very complicated in their development, where the renal vein splits and encircles the aorta. These things usually are of, of inconsequential, but sometimes you put a little uh, cage in your inferior vein cavity to catch blood clots. This can have an impact on that, which in a way too complicated to explain to you now. But just thought I'd show you, this is what's called a retroaortic inferior, uh, retroaortic left renal vein. So this does not cross the anterior surface of the aorta inferior to the SMA. Here's another thing. This is a 17-year-old boy playing, played soccer. Fell down or was kicked on his right side. Here's spleen. Here's stomach. Person's lying on his back. Here's air in the anterior part of the stomach. This person has food uh, in the, in the uh, fundal, fundal region of the stomach, in the posterior region. Aorta, IVC must be here somewhere. Kidney on the left side coming into view. Anybody see anything on? So what do you think is damaged here? Kidney. The right kidney. This person had serious damage to the right kidney with bleeding into the capsule called Gerota's uh, fascia, which this is what's called perirenal and extrarenal. This is all blood clot. This whole big mass of stuff that we see here starting right there. That big gray mass is all blood. It may not be clotted at this point. It's all blood because this person had trauma to the right kidney. You can only tell what the right kidney is because you have to wait until you see contrast in it. That's where the actual kidney tissue is with the contrast in it. It's been torn apart. It's bled tremendously into the space around it and caused a, you know, a massive hematoma. And then we'll just finish up uh, with magnetic resonance imaging. This is a magnetic resonance angiogram. We're going to start at the back and work forward again. All we're going to do is concentrate on the relationships of structures. Now, when you start at the back, the soft tissue structures at the back are on the right, the liver, and on the left, the spleen. The spleen is really quite a posterior organ. Also, the kidneys, which are sitting in the retroperitoneal region. All right. This is an air-filled structure that has a relationship to the spleen at the back of your abdomen. Therefore, that's the fundus of the stomach. All right. We go forward one, one level. Forward, nothing changes. Forward, nothing's changing. Forward, nothing changes. Ah. We come into, there's a magnetic resonance angiogram. So arteries and veins to a certain degree, depending on how they are going to appear white. And we're seeing now a linear structure forming on the left anterior side of the vertebral column. So that is where our aorta is. Spleen, stomach, liver, and kidneys haven't changed. We come forward again. We see more and more of the aorta. We come forward again, and we see what is that. We start to see another vascular structure this one to the right of the aorta, and embedded in a groove on the back surface of the liver. So that is the IVC. We come forward again. We've already lost our left kidney by this time. The person's left kidney is either small or very posterior. Come forward again. Forward again. Nothing of great interest. 
you know, we see some things of great interest right here. Here's spleen. Here's a soft tissue structure that has a vessel running along its upper border and sort of twisty and a vessel running posterior to it. Now, this is a variation you often see. This soft tissue structure running from the spleen, that is, in fact, here's the tail of the pancreas turning into the body of the pancreas. You sometimes see the splenic artery wrap itself around the splenic vein. You don't often see it, but in this person, case, you do. You have a splenic artery right here along the upper border of the pancreas, splenic vein posterior to the pancreas, and the artery is wrapped around it. We're going posteriorly. Here's a big hepatic vein going into the inferior vena cava from the liver into the inferior vena cava. Pancreas, a splenic vein, a splenic artery right there. A vessel going to the kidney, coming from the aorta. So this is the right renal artery. A vessel coming from the aorta and going to going backwards, the left kidney, so that's the left renal artery. I would like to see the veins in front of the renal arteries. This is, this in fact is, oops, I don't know why I stopped there. I don't know why I stopped there. These are just things I already told you about. You see, I don't, I don't think I organized this properly. These are the pancreas and splenic artery vein that I told you about. Here's the aorta, here's the celiac artery and superior mesenteric artery coming out the aorta, superior mesenteric artery heading inferiorly. Splenic vein should cross the origin of the superior mesenteric artery and it's going to. And the splenic vein here is joining the SMV, which runs to the right of the SMA, to form the portal vein. Just look at that, same error. What's wrong with this? How is this labeled incorrectly? It's a common hepatic artery. Yeah, because that's a common hepatic artery, not the gas of duodenal. Here is our celiac to the right, common hepatic to the left, splenic. Is there a left gastric here? Yeah, see that thing heading up like that? I'm calling it left gastric. <laughs> well, it has to head up to get to the, yeah, it got to head up. Uh, and then here's the head of the pancreas, which overlies the inferior vena cava. If I go backwards, here's the aortic inferior vena cava, the head of the pancreas overlies the inferior vena cava. Here's the head of the pancreas. That's where the SMV is coming. Here's the uncinate process of the pancreas will be tucked in right there behind the SMV. Splenic vein is joining SMV to form portal. And maybe that's all that there is of any interest. Yeah, colon is boring. Here it is. You know, I mean, just air filled. This person's splenic flexion is where the books tell you it is, right at the inferior border of the spleen. Twenty-nine of stump three is transverse colon. That's that's pretty boring. You can do that yourself. This is the last slide. You, these things you're going to see today in the section. I think you do. In the chest, there are these things called intercostal arteries. And you know they come off every segmental level, travel down towards the ribs and then travel out. There are in the lumbar region comparable vessels called lumbar arteries. I've only labeled them on the right side of this person. Let's follow, yeah, follow them. Am I, I'm coming forward. Yes, I'm coming forward. Here you can see them arising right there from the aorta. Now I'm going to start at the aorta and go backwards. Lumbar arteries traveling on the sides 
of the, of the lumbar vertebrae to reach the abdominal wall and act like intercostal arteries. These arteries I only put here, you think, well, these are so horribly trivial. Why would anybody even care about them? Uh, they're very important in aortic aneurysm surgery because they are a source of potential problems of arterial blood flowing backwards through them into the area where you put your Dacron graft and actually ruining the graft by causing it to compress. So lumbar arteries are important largely because they have to be tied off when you do aortic aneurysm surgery so that there's no back bleeding into the region where you're putting your graft. So that's no reason. But you can see everything on these things. I mean, you can see everything you dissected on this stuff. I'm finished. <laughs>